Hey there, it's Scary Parish. It's Wednesday, February 2nd, 2022. Welcome back to the CBS Sports I Own College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, please smash that like button like you're Brandon Davis. It's, it's right in front of you. It costs you nothing, but it sure would mean a lot to us. So smash the like button if you're watching on YouTube. And while you're here, please go ahead and uh, hit the subscribe button too. We thank you in advance. Dead leg. Big Tuesday night of college basketball. It's in the books. We should probably start with the happenings in Lubbock, Texas. Final score, Texas Tech 77. Texas 64. Chris Beard's return to United Supermarkets Arena. It did not go well for Chris Beard, but it went well for everybody else in Lubbock, it appeared. I know you watched it. Uh, what did you think of the scene and everything else that went down at Texas Tech on Tuesday night? You know what? I thought it was uh, the best possible scenario imaginable for Texas Tech and its fan base and Mark Adams and everyone there because that was and I had I had expressed a little bit of just you know kind of like concern about if uh, if everyone was going to be on uh, their most appropriate behavior, I guess, if you will. And they were. This is what you want. This is exactly what we want. This is what we want college sports to be. That arena was a madhouse and they appropriately uh, treated Chris Beard and the Longhorns with the uh, the right amount of disdain, hate, and Texas Tech wound up winning the game. Had one of its best performances of the season, and uh, I thought it was I thought it was great. I th- I think that this kind of true, passionate, uh, touchable, tangible, tasteable hate is great for college sports, and I thought that was wonderful. We can get into the details of the game if you want, but just big picture, kind of stepping back, uh, you know, Texas Tech fans had. Uh, every reason to uh, to get out their frustration, but they had no reasons to be angry by the end of the night. And I thought that was really, really cool. Great. By the way, Texas Tech has been a better team than Texas this season. And that kind of played out as well. So that was that's just my quickie big picture takeaway is that it couldn't have been a better advertisement for how awesome true intrastate intra conference rivalries can be good on you. Red Raiders fans, you got a you got a great team. You You showed yourself well and. I wish we could have an atmosphere like that literally every single night on television across the country. But obviously what we saw there was a, was a bit rare for, uh, for Texas Tech and Texas. It was awesome. Awesome to look at. Awesome to listen to. The game was the game. Whatever. It seemed pretty obvious to me very quickly. Texas is not winning this game. Like they're just they're not winning this game. I hesitated. to. I almost tweeted like, I don't know, GP, like late into the first half say, saying something like, uh, you know, the gods are clearly with Texas Tech tonight, but you you never want to get too early in that, and then you get old takes exposed. So I didn't, but I'm with you. Like deep into the first half, I kind of felt like this is this they're not getting out of there with the win, the longhorns, yeah. and that's not what happened. No, they can they can hang around and they did kind of hang around, although at a distance for most of the game. But it was like and, and perhaps I'm only saying this because I know how the game ended up. It's like I like you, I didn't tweet it last night, not because I was hesitant, but because I was busy in studio. But it just the, it just looked and felt like a game the home team is going to win. And um the 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 video of Chris walking onto the court for the initial time, letting Texas Tech fans lay eyes on him for the first time since he left uh, officially last April. Um that was that was tremendous. Uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, I am not somebody who loves college basketball and hates the NBA. Those people exist. Um, I love the NBA and I love college basketball. And I think the NBA is a better basketball product. Like it's, it's easier to watch. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's pros as, as opposed to amateurs. Kind of like watching a uh, high school baseball is uh, easier to watch than uh, eight year old baseball. You know, uh, you got amateurs in one place and, and, and pros in the other, uh, the shot making is better. The playmaking is better. Everything on the court is better, but what, college basketball can do that the NBA doesn't is that last night that scene you're not going to turn turn on any NBA game you want to tonight you won't see anything close to that nothing looks like that and that's where college basketball can have an advantage over the NBA Um, it can create environments that are unmatched and that one last night um, as good as it gets I I, you know I, I I Chris Patola was was on the call I believe and I think he made the point that it's the best atmosphere we've seen in college basketball this season. Um, I'll take him at his word. It sure looked like that on television. And I think you could argue one of the wildest atmospheres we've seen in a long time. Maybe ever. I mean, I don't know. But, like, 
you you don't get this situation very often where um less than a year after a school's most successful coach, I hesitate to call him best because I know Bob Knight coached there and Tubby right. Smith coached there, but certainly most successful in the sense that he did things Bob Knight never did and Tubby Smith never did. First Elite Eight in school history, first Final Four in school history, first national title game appearance in school history. That guy, um, becoming somebody you, you start talking about, man, if he stays here long enough, they might put his name on the court. That guy comes back, not just as a visiting coach, and not just less than a year later, but as the visiting coach less than a year later of your biggest in-state rival, a school that, best I can tell from Twitter mentions, um, that looks down at you and thinks very little of you. We're the University of Texas, and you are what you are. We are Austin, Texas, and you are Lubbock. And that guy's coming back coaching that team. We don't get stuff like that very often. Like I had somebody on Twitter Tuesday afternoon, because as I wrote in Tuesday morning's top 25 and one, like, um, I, I don't get it. I don't get the hatred for a guy who gave you your best basketball memories and then left in a way that any of us would have left, uh, or, or at least 99% of us would have left. And, um, you know, uh, some guy was like, well, can you tell me the last time a coach left for a school in the same conference in the same state for a rival? And I was like, well, no, because it doesn't happen, you know, but it did happen here. It's an extremely rare thing. Um, it, it happened here and it created this incredible, um, you know, environment. And I, I don't know if you picked up on this and maybe it's just, you know, I'm seeing it the way I see it. But Chris never looked comfortable when he walked in. He didn't look comfortable when he was going through the handshake line at the end. He didn't look comfortable. And I, I mentioned this on Inside College Basketball Tuesday night. It's got to be, I don't care how focused you are, it's got to be a weird feeling to walk into that place and see a lot of faces of people who used to love you, and now they are double bird cussing you. Um, you know, you, you, you can be as mentally prepared as you think you are um, for that, but walking in, surrounded by like a million security guards, it just, the whole scene was wild. Yeah, no, that's that's the that's the penance, though. You take the bigger job with with a lot more money, top five paid coach in men's college basketball, all the college basketball, and yeah, that's what you, you're just going to have to endure that this season and every season going forward, although I'll be interested to see a year from now or approximately a year from now, um, if this can be matched, I don't think so. This was the first one, but I think every single time he comes back, uh, it's it's going to be something of a of a special night and you know circle the calendar kind of game for that that fan base there. Uh, let, let, let me ask you this. Yeah, because even Mark Adams said at some point recently, either before the game or after, this will fade over time. Like the the disdain will be replaced by appreciation. It'll be a sliding scale. You'll never go from A to B. But it'll, yeah. it'll it'll be like, we hate this guy. We hate this guy. Not so much. We kind of don't care anymore. Wow, he did take us to the national title game. Right. You know, it, it'll, it'll slide. Do you think Chris Beard will ever come back to Lubbock and be honored by Texas Tech? Great question. Ah, uh, man, we are too deep into a raw, open wound to uh, accurately try and predict if that's going to happen because – I mean, even Brian Hamilton of The Athletic, he was on the ground there in Lubbock, I think, like three days in advance of this game. And so he did some reporting, talked to the AD, and you had, like, you know, influential people going on the record and basically saying, like, this is the one spot you don't leave. You don't leave Texas Tech to go to Texas, even though, you know, people not tied to Texas Tech would disagree with that. Yeah, I know, no, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Okay. So anyway, but you get the point that I'm bringing up here. Uh, mm -hmm. Because of that, there's, you know, and it's not like Chris Beard was there for – eight years, let alone 12 or 15. I mean, he was there for a hot minute and brought that school to places it had never been before. I'm not convinced that'll ever happen, particularly when he's at, he's at Texas. Um, now these schools will soon enough uh, by 2025 at the latest, they will no longer even be conference rivals. they will be intrastate rivals, you know, but they're not going to schedule each other. They're not going to play each other anymore. Texas is going to the sec. And so, um, they won't even have to face each other all that much, but for the next, you know, couple of years. Yeah. I think that, I think the big 12 plans on Texas, literally in Oklahoma being in the league until it's contractually no longer obligated to do so come 2025. And so I, 
my guess right now, who knows, well, if we look up to 15 years, what the situation is, and they haven't faced each other, and you know, they haven't just crossed paths for 10 plus years. If Beard's still at Texas or not, I don't know, but I'm gonna say no. I would probably lean toward no, just because um the whole leaving for Texas thing really, really really bothers them. Like I saw the quote from Kirby Hoke, who's the Texas Tech athletic director, who is a great athlete, ad, athletic director, smart guy, somebody I respect and like. Um, but I think his quote was something like, you, you just, you don't leave Texas Tech for Texas. And I'm like, well, of course, uh, like, of course you do. Uh, especially if you're Chris Beard. I mean, we might look back and this could be a grass wasn't greener situation, just like Chris Mack leaving Xavier for Louisville and it just didn't go well. We could look back at that. I mean, these things are never guaranteed, but um, there's not a person with Chris Peard's background that would not have left for Texas when the Texas job opened and was offered to him. That's just the truth. And I get a lot of this from Texas Tech fans uh, about, well, what you don't understand and what you don't understand. And one of the things, and this isn't unique to Texas Tech fans, it's it, it applies to all fan bases, Kentucky fans, Louisville fans, Maryland fans, it doesn't matter. When you, when everybody or, or most people see this a certain way and it runs completely uh, contrary to the way you see it, maybe it's the, maybe you're too close to it to understand as opposed to we're too far from it to understand because I don't know, there's a guy in the, in the uh, YouTube comments right now. And I'm only mentioning him because th this is a sentiment I read over and over again on Tuesday. I think what non-tech people don't get with the beard situation is that if he went anywhere else, there wouldn't be the hate, but going to an in-state rival and competing for the same recruits, there's got to be hate. Like that is a pretty common sentiment among Texas tech fans. If he'd have left for Kentucky or North Carolina or the NBA, that'd have been one thing. But to leave us for Texas, that's another. And when I write or say, I don't understand that, I don't mean I don't understand why you're mad. I understand why you're mad because you've told me 50,000 times. What I mean is I don't understand why that is so offensive to you. Because from my perspective, and this is at least the way I live my life, I don't get mad at anybody for doing something I would do. I don't. I, I, I find it intellectually weird to be angry at somebody who merely did the same thing I would have done in the same situation. Chris Mack took the Texas tech job when it was the best job he could get. <laughs> he embraced Chris Beard. It. Chris Beard. You just said Chris Mack. Although that would be oh. fascinating as hell. I just want to, just want to just... Chris Beard. Let me restart. Chris Beard took the Texas tech job when it was the best job he could get. And he worked it hard every day. And he did unprecedented things. He was awesome there. Awesome. You guys loved him. He was awesome. And, 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 and remember, was at UNLV for literally a, a meal and a cup of coffee. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, and before that, and before that was at Little Rock. By the way, why such a bad guy when he takes a better job this time, but wasn't a bad guy when he took a better job last time when it was your job? Like, why isn't he a scumbag for leaving UNLV or a scumbag for leaving Little Rock? Just a scumbag when he leaves you? This is the parts that I, I, I can't uh, attach myself to. He takes the Texas Tech job. He works it hard. Does it well. You loved him. You wanted him to be there forever. And then Shaka Smart lost a game to Abilene Christian, decided he didn't want to go back, be on the hot seat of Texas. So he goes to Marquette, Texas. Open. And then what you have is a situation where Chris Beard's alma mater is offering him more money more resources, what is widely viewed in the industry as a better job, and what is widely viewed in the country, and I say this with no offense, but as a better city. Just about any, I, I, I actually would argue anybody in Chris Beard's situation would then take the Texas job. And most people, regardless of their background or situations, would take the Texas job. So if we can all acknowledge that's true, what are we mad about? The guy did what any of us would have done. And you'll hear this, because it's going to show up in the comments soon, I'm certain. Well, it's not that he left, it's how he left. No, it's that he left. There is no way, if, if it's not that he left, it's how he left, then tell me in what way he could have left for the Texas job that you would have been like, okay, cool. There's no way. If you're mad at Chris Beard, if you hate Chris Beard today, you would have hated him no matter how he left. And 
yet any of us with his background in his shoes would have done what he did, would have left when he left. So if we can all acknowledge that, I, I don't know. I just can't get mad at somebody for doing something that I would have done. And uh, uh, furthermore, write it down. Put it in stone. You'll never hear me get mad at somebody for taking a new job, for doing something that they think is best for themselves, for their career, or their family, or a combination of all three. Why would, why would I get mad at somebody for doing that when I've done the same thing in my life? And it doesn't mean when you leave a job for another job that you hated, that you hated the job that you had. I used to work at a newspaper. I loved it. And then I got offered a better job that anybody in my shoes would have accepted. So I took it. And it doesn't mean that I hated working at the place or I did. It just, I did what humans do. And Chris Beard did what humans do. And I don't care if you hate him because, like, it doesn't matter to me. It impacts my life in no way whatsoever. I'm just saying I think it's silly. You're never going to move me off the point of I think it's silly to get mad at somebody making a career choice that just about any of us in that person's shoes would make. Uh, I just, so GP said everything that needs to be said on that angle of it. I'm just going to circle back to, this is great for the big 12 and for college basketball. We need more of this. You know, we've got some really strong, really great rivalries across college sports. That's not nothing new. And thankfully that it actually helps uh, college basketball uh, to a certain degree remain relevant throughout the regular season. But we do have an element here that's just going to be ticked up for a few for a few years. And I think that's, I think that's wonderful. I thought the, the scene again, it could not have gone better unless you're a Texas fan. It could not have gone better in any way other than like Texas tech winning at the buzzer. That's pretty much it, but it won comfortably. It was in command the whole game. That building was on fire. It was awesome. Uh, Kevin McCuller was fantastic. Kevin O'Banner had a really good game. And just in terms of the, uh, the result and what it means to the landscape of, the big 12 i'll just i'll hit on this and then we can move on gp texas actually it's it's not that it was going to win the big 12 anyway but it's hopes of even like somehow trying to finagle a way to to finish atop the standings remember preseason top five team in the eyes of some preseason top 10 team in the eyes of many and preseason top 15 team and according to everyone i believe um texas now has four league losses so as we sit here on friday uh, friday on wednesday morning kansas which won at iowa state they're seven and one in the league then Baylor seven and two, Texas Tech bumped up to six and three. TCU is four and three, and now Texas is a five and four team in the Big Twelve. Going to get to the tournament, um, but it just squeaked back into the AP Top Twenty Five this week. It will almost certainly probably fall out when we go back next week. So that was a uh, it was a good opportunity for Texas to really improve its resume and its seeding chances and its uh, standing in the Big Twelve race. But it takes the loss, understandably, on the road, and now uh, it's going to probably be either Kansas or Baylor with Texas Tech having still an outside shot. And I don't, you know, we shouldn't forget that. Um, this team now ranks 11th at Ken Palm as of this morning, and it is, uh, it's screaming toward a really, really good seat. Um, it's, it's 12th in Sagarin, 14 uh, in BPI, 10th in the net. So good on Mark Adams. He's done a wonderful job, and that was, a, that was a really cool scene in Lubbock on Tuesday. Before we move on, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, we're 18 minutes into the thing. It's all been about Chris Beard and his return to Texas Tech and how and why he decided to leave there after five years. Um, great for Mark Adams. This is a man who is a respected ball coach for decades. And, you know, I, I can't speak for Mark, but if I were Mark and I'm in my 60s and I still haven't got this big boy Division One job, I'm assuming at that point probably not happening. You know, you don't get your first big power conference head coaching job in your 60s. That's not a normal thing. And then Chris leaves. And I don't know if the initial plan was just to promote Mark Adams. But ultimately, that's where they landed. And he has killed it since getting that job. If you were skeptical, he might not be able to do it for one reason or another. He has eliminated all of those questions um, to this point. Um, could we look up in three years and be having different? I guess so. You know, again, th these things can flip on people. That happens all the time. But, it, you know, as I was watching Chris Beard have to deal with that situation last night, um, I also enjoy watching Mark Adams get to enjoy that situation last night. 
um, to coach in that arena, to coach on national television, to get to beat you know his employer's rival and beat him pretty good, and also beat his former boss friend as well, but also former boss. Um, it was a you know I, I think the big story was Chris Beard's back in Lubbock and look at this. But the other story is Mark Adams is is coaching in the Big Twelve and doing a tremendous job. You know, I was in studio Tuesday night with, among others, Wally Zerbiak. And Wally's really good at like, um, I don't care what Ken Palm says. I don't care what the net says. I'm just watching basketball teams. And I can tell you who's good and who isn't. I can tell you who's good enough to maybe win a title and who isn't. And he was like, Texas Tech's good enough to compete for whatever they're competing for in this country this season. Texas Tech is is on the list of teams that's good enough. Um, they're, they, they play hard. They're tough. Um, and they got they got enough dudes to to go do the whole thing, and so um, just a tremendous night in love, but great scene and a, a an awesome win uh, for Mark Adams and and his Red Raiders. Elsewhere on uh, Tuesday night, Auburn completed a regular season sweep of Alabama. Bruce Pearl got the broom out. <laughs> did you see that? I did. <laughs> Every game is something with this team, and, and rightfully so. Bama made a good push. Auburn drops one hundred. On its blood rival, 181, and gets the broom out. Uh, remember, Bama did this last season. Bama swept Auburn a season ago when Auburn was down, and now they return favor. Yeah, that was uh, that was too good. And that was the other big game that happened right alongside. Obviously, people listening were probably watching. It was Texas Tech, Kansas, and then Auburn, Alabama, that were on ESPN and ESPN two. And for a while there, it was like neither was close. And then Bama made it interesting. Texas made it interesting. But then you know Auburn, yeah, Auburn ran away late. Walker Kessler, 14 points, 12 rebounds, eight. Blocks breaking out, break he breaking out four steals. Four I gave steals. you correct, and I gave you uh props on our HQ hit over the weekend. I guess you it did. was. I remember. Um, but I'm gonna do it again here on the podcast because I believed you, but I didn't fully believe you when you were saying that Walker. Remember what was your damn line with this? You you had said like he averaged, you know, call it. Um, it was there were two games was where he played. 40. It was his yeah. per forty or something. No, like that. it was he. He only played more than twenty minutes twice, so he yeah, barely yeah. he barely played. But when he played more than twenty minutes, it was this, 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 and this. And you were like, "That's two games sample size." And I was like, "You're right, you're right, but that's got breakout potential." He's he's right there with Johnny Davis. And like Keegan Murray was expected to be better, so he's out there. But like Walker Kessler now, eleven and a half points, eight boards, and he is at four point two blocks per game. So yeah, one of the breakout players there. Not a ton to take away from the game. I know you're kind of running yeah. through this, but just, yeah, Auburn Auburn wins with ease, and they're twenty one and one. They have more wins than anyone in the sport right now. Just uh, one thing on this, and then we'll move on, because uh, we've talked so much about Auburn and Alabama. I don't know what else there is to say. Um, Auburn is awesome, and Alabama is confusing. Um, but one interesting note, on Sunday night's podcast, we mentioned that Alabama, in its win over Baylor, shot 78.6% from two. Alabama is one of the best two-point uh, field goal percentage teams in the country, offensively. And against Baylor, it was 786 Against Auburn, 33.3 from two. That's Walker Kessler. I mean, that, 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 yeah. that's, that's one team's got Walker Kessler standing around the rim, and the other team does not. Elsewhere, LSU lost for the fifth time in six games. Davidson went to St. Bonaventure and won, got them back in the top 25 and won. Kansas won at, Ohio, at Iowa State. No Ochai Abaji, no Remy yes. Martin. So that was impressive. Providence, won again, improved to 19 and 2, this time um, at St. John's. Uh, Creighton snapped UConn's five game winning streak. I'll just let you take all of that or anything else, wherever you want to take it. Cool. Will do. I saw a comment early on in the YouTube chat um, wanting us to just at least address uh, Carolina Louisville. We'll do that on the back end of this. Um, I got a, so a couple couple random thoughts on everything you just mentioned there. Yeah, Kansas getting the win the way it did was obviously impressive. Noah Baji. Um, I have a I, I have a couple buddies who like to wager on call. Basically, like once the NFL playoffs get going, they just start you know wagering on college basketball and and whatever. And I I don't do that, but th I'm I'm in these group texts and uh, the feeling from them. I, I'd be interested to know if uh, if listeners feel the same was after Iowa State. You know, it didn't cover. I guess I, Iowa State is now on is is on the uh, do not trust list. So <laughs> this was like the overwhelming. I don't know if they I, I, I would I, I would tell you, I got friends who 
yeah, better like, college basketball. Iowa State is now dead to them, apparently, because it's like we will not trust this team whatsoever. Because they knew Abaji was out. They're like right. good defensive team at home. They didn't cover. So anyway, I can't, go ahead. I can't tell you because my friends, uh, they, they're on Twitter. And so they see this news as soon as it breaks. And if you're really on it, like uh, breaking, Ocha Abaji didn't make the trip to Ames. If you're really on it, you can get that bet in before the line adjust. And so I can't tell you how many people I know or uh, just I'm assuming people around the country. They, they see, uh, oh, Abaji, Abaji's out. They're going to Hilton without him. You can get that Iowa State plus whatever yeah. before the number adjust. And best I can tell, that bet backfires more often than it actually works. Because <laughs> Kansas goes to Iowa State and uh, they just handle them. You know, it, it was really no problem. Uh, in Iowa State, still has a resume worthy of top 25 and in one inclusion, still has a resume worthy of, you know, top seven seed in the NCAA tournament, which is more or less what that is. Um, but they, uh, they, they've they slipped a little bit. That seems pretty clear. We talked about Providence plenty on this, so we're not going to get into them again. Uh, if they continue to win, we'll, we'll talk about the Fires playing more. But just a, a, a blind, uh, let's just blindly guess right now for fun. It's, it's February 2nd. Providence is 19 and two. I looked at the resume last night. Uh, Palm has him as a two seed. I think you can make that argument. I think I put him as the number one three seed as of this morning. But just you know, six less than six weeks out from Selection Sunday, what's our guess here? I'm gonna say I, I'm gonna say the Providence Friars, which are as we speak this morning because they keep winning close. This team is 48th in Ken Palm. Right. Um. So that I, would suggest that I, would suggest I, that they're gonna take some losses that are overdue here. That's we'll just suggest it. I'm gonna say. Because the resume is still strong, Parrish, I'm going to say PC is going to be on the back end of the three line. Maybe they're the last number one. Th that's my guess. Uh, Selection Sunday, Providence is on the three line. What's your what's your just what's your guess when we get there? Top four seed. Um, I guess if I got to pick a number, I'll go three as well, yeah. because the body of work is is really impressive. The computer numbers and the selection committee, you can say. Well, the computer numbers don't matter. They're going to matter. The, the committee is the committee is going to look at these computer numbers. Yes. Um and the same way we think it's wild when Loyola Chicago gets whatever seat it got last year. Was it an eight? Something like that. Yeah. Despite despite having incredible computer numbers, it's going to be um, something it, that like that works both ways. You, you know, if, if you think it's crazy to give an eight seed to somebody who's got a top 10 Kimpom number, then if you're being consistent. It's also crazy to give a you know a two seed to somebody that's got a forty eight beside him at Ken Palm, and so the committee's going to have to work through that. And I'm not saying there's an easy solution to it because, um, you are right. Based on the computer numbers, it suggests that Providence um, uh, is going to you know take some losses that are maybe a little overdue because. Uh, you know, they're not actually operating at the level of a top 15 team, even if they have the resume of a, a top 15 team. On the other hand, you could argue, and I think Ed Cooley would argue this, um, we're not just winning close games because we're lucky. We're kidding, right. winning close games because we're experienced, because we're smart, because we're tough, because we're strong-minded, um, because we stay calm under pressure. And I do think there's something to that. I, I told you, I think it was the Butler game a few weekends ago, but I was I was watching it, and FS1, I believe, had a camera in Ed's huddle, and they were down in the second half. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and by the way, coaches are very aware when that camera's in the huddle, so they, they, they conduct themselves accordingly. And there's also an agreement between uh, the network and the coach. Like, I'll let that camera in my huddle, but, like, if I say – don't burn um, me. Yeah. Yeah. Don't burn me. Like if I say, are you a F and P like you're not putting that on FS1, right? So there's an understanding there. You're never going to see anything controversial coming out of a huddle, but Ed, this is the point was actually doing breathing exercises with his team in the huddle. Uh, we're fine. There's look at them. It's a clock. We're at home. Plenty of time on the clock. Take a deep breath. Let's breathe. Let's breathe together. It was just really, I don't think they're calm under pressure just because it's randomly calm under pressure. I think it starts at the top. I think it starts with him. And so I'm a little hesitant to say, ah, they just get lucky. Cause I don't know that that's true. I think there's something to be said for, they are built for those moments and ways that other teams aren't. For instance, when I'm playing golf, I miss most putts no matter what, but I can tell you when I'm like, make this six footer to win the hole, I get bothered by that. 
I don't I I am not as good under that pressure as um mm-hmm. as somebody as somebody else might be. I'm not good at, anyway. I'm not trying to uh, uh, uh misrepresent, but I'm like a, I am I am I will miss a putt under pressure that I otherwise would have a better chance of making. Cuz I'm weak minded on the golf course. <laughs> that, uh, that, you're not you're not alone. That's that's part of what makes golf fun and I do that with my with my buds as well. Literally drop a 10 yeah. on the green, you're 10 feet out, make it, it's yours and you don't make it. Like we Yeah, yeah, all, no. Oh, I, I had a I had a guy one time who I uh was with and and he was really good and he, he we got to talking and he he was like yeah you know I tried to play professionally just couldn't do it and I was like oh you know what was the problem he said I could go out same exact course same exact conditions I could go out with you and I shoot sixty seven you put me in a tournament against other people who are competing like for real things uh, I shoot a seventy four like I really was that different of a golfer. Nothing's changed other than the circumstances, and I could not mentally handle it. So that's a real thing. My point is, Providence, I think, can mentally handle it. That's what they've shown throughout the season, and um, it, it's it's one of the, the the best stories going in college basketball. Twenty one games, nineteen wins. Um, everybody loves that Cooley, and so that's been a fun one to to watch unfold. Second. In strength of record, number two in the country in strength of record behind only your Auburn Tigers, but all the way down at 48 in Ken Palm among the six metrics on the team sheets. Elsewhere that happened on Tuesday night um, with what you mentioned, Davidson wins at at the Bonnies. So Davidson's got a a clear and comfortable at large resume at this point. That's a great thing. The A-10, if it's going to get to be a multi-bid league here, it's going to have to have Davidson not win the Atlantic 10 tournament. And now Bonnies, you know, this was a team that was eight and one. At start of the season with wins over uh, Boise State, that's looking like a better win by the week. Boise State's won 14 in a row. Win over Marquette, that looks even better now than it did at the time. Uh, but they've been slipping. They're now four and three. Now they're not out of it, out of it. But St. Bonaventure is going to have to go on a deep, deep run here because the Atlantic 10, I would say, VCU. Uh, which is highlighted in Wednesday's court report. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I think has a, a little bit of a shot there, but I was looking because I actually talked with VCU coach Mike Rhodes for what I did on the court report for Wednesday. Uh, I was talking with him on on Tuesday, I guess it was. And if you look at the A10 right now, this is I'm just I'm just brought up the league page on Ken Palm, so uh, forgive me. In fact, not a, if you can in real time here. We didn't pre-produce this, but can you go to Ken Palm? Bring up the Atlantic 10 league page. I don't know if you've, he's ever done this. This might be, I think you can do it. Bring up the Atlantic 10 page so people watching on YouTube can see this in real time. Hey, YouTube. And where where hey, everyone YouTube. ranked on adjusted efficiency margin. Davidson is 51. You've got uh, St. Louis at 63, VCU 68, Dayton 76. The Bonnies are now down to 95, 10 spots behind Richmond. George Mason, which, oh, by the way, has only one league loss alongside Davidson, is 106. And then Rhode Island is 101. So what we could actually have here, here we go, bringing up that page on YouTube. Look at so Hey, YouTube. You have a lot of teams that I think are capable of winning the Atlantic 10 tournament because it feels very crap shooty in the top half of the league. But these teams are not rated well enough across the net to give you a comfortable chance at being a two bid league, let alone a three bid league. So uh, the A10 is in a weird spot. It, you know, it doesn't have high end at large teams. It doesn't have a bunch of crappy teams. It's just got a lot in the middle there. And because of that, as you can see next to the Atlantic 10 at the top, it's the tenth rated league in the country this season. And if Davidson wins the auto bid there is a chance the A-10 is actually a one-bid conference, particularly if the Mountain West and the West Coast Conference really do have four teams apiece. The A-10 could wind up being a victim of that. But I just thought it was, it's just interesting. I didn't think the league would be going this way, Parrish. Uh, you know, you got a, a bunch of teams that can win it, and um, and we'll see wh- which way it goes. Good for Davidson. They're going to be a clear-cut at-large candidate. But if they win the league, the, the conference you have been the uh, the in-person MC of for many a year. Pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic. That's right. Right. It's going to Mas- be master of yeah. ceremonies, a 10 media day, pre pandemic. It might be That's- over. It might be over for me. I, I, I think it actually, uh, I think it actually is. Uh, UConn loses at home to Creighton. Creighton has been, I think McDermott has four wins in a row now against UConn. Uh, Huskies taking a home loss, not looking good in the process. Now 15 and five 
Creighton at least keeps its tournament hopes alive with a with a road win like this. It had dropped four of its previous six. Creighton also has wins over Villanova, Marquette, and BYU at this point. So Blue Jays fans, you're still alive. And um, and so I wanted to note that they've got a game Friday at Seton Hall. And if Creighton can win that, then yeah, the Big East is still it's got you know seven teams that are that are kind of angling and uh, and still in the discussion overall to uh, to get a bid. Um, all right, Carolina Louisville. I was at, I was in the middle of doing a, a few different things. I did not see this happen in real time. I know you were in studio and you've got a multiple monitor situation there, but so maybe you can speak to this. I saw the highlights afterward, but UNC wins 90 to 83 at Louisville. These are like Carolina's on track to make the tournament. Louisville obviously is not, but I actually thought it was important to Carolina's resume. If it wants to get into that single digit seed territory and remain there, like I'm going to blindly say UNC I'm going to say it's what, like a seven seed as of this morning, maybe an eight seed. I, but, think, I think lower, dude. Like lower? They, is it? They, yeah. they, they're 0 and 6 in quadrant one. Are they okay? Do they have like, any uh, bad losses? No, uh, no, no. That's the thing. They're, they're no, 0 and 6 in quadrant one, no additional losses, but they're 4 and 6 in the first two quadrants. Like they're not as safe as you might think uh, because think they beat nobody. Uh, they beat nobody. I'm looking. Like, like, congrats on winning at Louisville. It's better than Man. losing at Louisville. But when you you shouldn't if you're a legitimate NBA uh, NCAA tournament team, you I don't know that you got to have overtime to beat a team whose coach quit last week. You know. You're right. They need. Um, it's just getting to a point as as the schedule moves on here. The best wins are Michigan at home. Man, they're Michigan at home. They're Furman at home. They're Virginia Tech at home and at Louisville, I think, are their four best wins right now. Uh, what, so, what, yeah, the, what, yeah. what the committee has told us in the past is that you got to show us you can beat somebody. Anybody can get into the bracket and lose to good teams. That ain't what we're looking for. Who can you beat? And so far, North Carolina hasn't really shown that. I, I Like, if I had to bet yes or no, would they be in the tournament? I'll bet yes. Um, but they've got work to do. They're not, they're not completely safe because, um, again, there's 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 nothing from a win perspective in the first quarter. Zero oh, and six. That means every time mm. they played one of the those. <laughs> this is that part where I I explain something that doesn't need to be explained at all. Zero oh, and six in the first quarter, and that means dead leg. Every time they played a quarter one game, they've lost it. Not that hard to follow, and you are right on the money. But you and the, <laughs> I had not examined the resume. You bring it in. Listen, you're doing this on a daily basis. Yeah, they're not a seven seed. They're not an eight seed with that. Um, I'd have to compare to other teams given the record. Uh, that's that feels like a 10 at best right now. Um, but the the uh, the officiating in this game, uh, ab abnormally unreliable. Okay. The, you know, between what's happened with Armando Baycott and then I guess it was Sidney Curry who got called for the foul, even though Baycott's arm just completely lashed against Curry's throat there. And Mike Pegues was like, Mike Pegues is just understandably just furious. Like he's, you know, he's the interim coach trying to guide this team through a chaotic transition. And, and it's not like Carolina got all the breaks with, with the whistle that definitely did not happen. But I think both like Carolina fans were probably just happy to get out of there with a win. They, you know, pulled away in overtime and the whistle helped them with that. But uh, it seemed like everyone was just extremely angry with what went down at the Yum Center on Tuesday. And I think Louisville fans at this point are exhausted. They're just exhausted. They can't even watch their team play a game uh, and and not feel some sort of existential dread because something else just keeps happening to this team in this program. So um, I know a couple people, more than a couple, I had people find me on Twitter and then in the chat they wanted us to at least address the game. Um, so I am. I understand that I saw some of the highlights. I didn't see the stuff in real time, but it was yeah, that was that was brutal. That was rough. And if you're Louisville, you're just trying to get through the end of the season and just see where the coaching change goes from there. Carolina's got to start winning. It, oh, by the way, as Duke at home this weekend, we will obviously talk about that game on the Friday episode. Um, just for what it's worth, and I think it's worth a lot because I love Jerry Palm. He, he doesn't have North Carolina in the bracket right now. Oh, my goodness. Well, he hasn't <laughs> updated it. He hasn't. Oh, so that would probably have been a Monday after when that's what a quad. That's a quad one. Louisville. No, quad it's one? not. Quad no, two. It's, you said they're 0-6. Yeah. yeah, they're 0-6 in quad ones. At Louisville Which, is a quad two win. It's automatic. People don't realize it's about the net. Um, if you there, there's no scenario where you can get a quad one win by beating a team whose coach just quit. 
automatically okay. goes automatically goes quad two or lower. I'm gonna have to follow you on that uh, and trust you on that one. But yeah, yeah Palm didn't happen to feel as a Monday. Text Rolling. Gavin. Text Gavin. Ask him. He'll tell you. I'm not, yeah. Oh man! Uh, all right, that's that's pretty much all I got from Tuesday, except for I want your thoughts on something. Uh, Georgetown, and you, I think this is the focus of your top twenty-five and one on Wednesday morning. Georgetown loses again, seventy to sixty-three at home, Seton Hall. It's now zero and eight. Georgetown, I I think when it got to zero and five, it was it had never been zero and five in Biggie's play. And if it wasn't zero and five, it was one hundred percent. It had never been zero and six in Biggie's play. Now it's zero and eight. Next game will come Thursday night at home against the slumping St. John's team. Maybe the Hoyas can get off the schneid there. Um, I just, I tweeted it on Tuesday. I honestly, truly never thought I would see the day where the Georgetown Hoyas were 0-8 in Big East play. So I ask you, A, your thoughts on the state of this program, and two, I think we would agree that Georgetown is not going to fire Patrick Ewing. But do you think we are now headed toward a situation where Ewing resigns for the betterment of his alma mater and Georgetown winds up opening when we get to March? It has to be on the table. Like, you know, Georgetown is a, a complex place. And um, it's always, uh, it's never easy to uh, to to guess how they might handle any situation, but it is going terribly. Um, I actually wrote about it in the dribble handoff. Um, our question this week was well, you know, coaches on the hot seat. And I decided to write about Patrick Ewing because a as I wrote, I grew up in the early eighties and my two, the two sports I attached to earliest were baseball and college basketball. So Patrick Ewing is literally one of the first larger than life sports figures I can remember. He was so awesome at Georgetown. And so when the Georgetown job opened and he was a candidate and he got the job, I, I can't tell you that I knew it would work because I'm done telling you I'm sure anything's going to work. I, I'll, I'll, I'll never do that again. I'll okay. never. All right, let's uh, let's just uh, loop back around six weeks. Let's see. Uh, how, let's let's see where we're at. Okay, unless it's Rick Patino. Rick Patino. Okay. <laughs> Rick, right. Rick Patino is the only thing I'll say works. After that, I just say, hey, I think it'll work. But uh, you know, I've been wrong before. Um, so I couldn't tell you I knew it would work, but I can tell you I hoped it would work. A, because I just think Georgetown being relevant in basketball is important. Um, that's one of the biggest brands in the history of the sport. Um, like, I knew of Georgetown as a child. I didn't know it was a great academic institution. I didn't know anything other than I that, that, that place got an awesome basketball team year after year after year. And, um, and so I hoped it would be I hope this Patrick Ewing thing would work because I just think college basketball is better when Georgetown matters. And then I hope it would work because I thought it would be cool, for lack of a better word, to watch Patrick Ewing mm -hmm. lead Georgetown back to a place of prominence. And what I noticed a few weeks ago is that, you know, because Patrick hasn't enrolled the number one recruiting class in two of the past three years or had a preseason top 15 ranking or cussed out the local media, told a columnist to stop asking stupid effing questions. Nationally, people just don't pay attention to it too much. But, you know, and they don't talk about it as much as, as the Memphis program under Penny Hardaway has been talked about. But if you're doing an honest assessment of things, and Memphis is an absolute circus, don't even get me started. <laughs> More reports last night that I just, will not get you started. That are just weird. But um low key, Patrick Ewing at Georgetown is much more of a thing that's not going well than Penny Hardaway at Memphis. Um, they're now 16, uh, six and thirteen overall this season, 0 and eight in the Big East. Um, they're they're at risk of, of going winless in the Big East. And they, if they did that, trivia time, trivia time. Fire it at me. If Georgetown goes winless mm -hmm. in the Big East, which is very much on the table. DePaul. What year? I'm going to pull. I'm just pulling it out of a hat. I'm going to say 12-13. 2009. 
Reddit, mm. Reddit, put that down as an incorrect answer from dead leg. So now Georgetown is 68 and 72 overall, 26 and 52 in Big East games under Patrick Ewing. They're on an eight game losing streak, and they're about to finish eighth or worse in the Big East for the fourth time in five years. So the question you asked me is, do they have to do something about Patrick Ewing at the end of this year, whatever that looks like? And I'll say, again, I don't know, because he's Patrick Ewing. The same way Memphis has to handle things differently because it's Penny Hardaway, I think Georgetown has to handle things differently than it's Patrick Ewing. We can both agree, I think we can both agree, if this dude's name was John Smith instead of Patrick Ewing, it'd be over with not even a chance of survival of getting a sixth year. Agreed. This but, is how, yeah, but it, is, but but it is Patrick Ewing, and I that has to be taken into consideration. You want to give him every opportunity to succeed. But how about this? The previous coach was John Thompson's son, mm -hmm. and they fired him for less or pushed him out for less. JT three made the NCAA tournament in eight of his first eleven seasons. Went to the Final Four in year three, and then fit. I mean, uh, yeah, went to the Final Four in year three. Eight NCAA tournaments, first 11 seasons, and then missed it, finished eighth in the Big East in year 12, missed the NCAA tournament again in year 13, finished ninth in the Big East, and that was that. So let me ask you this. Yep. If you move on from Big John's kid for missing the NCAA tournament a total of five times in 13 years, how do you keep anybody, even Patrick? After he misses it four times in five years and only made it the one time because of an auto bid, that team wasn't good either. Yep, let me put it this way. JT3 finished eighth or worse in the Big East four times in 13 seasons. Patrick's about to do it four times in five seasons. Yeah, I think that the that we're just about we're just about there in terms of needing to have a change. If it keeps going this way, I don't see why. It, it, they should continue on with this. When when Ewing was hired, it became official the day of the title game in 2017. I remember, you know, uh, hurriedly writing a column for my hotel room in Phoenix. Um, this is the end graph here. Uh, it's a, I, I wrote, but I can't say it's a great call or a bad call. I can't say that Ewing, now 54, has earned the right to try. In that regard, there's no better place to start because he has no softer place to lose. Pause real quick. I'm writing this because Ewing tried for so long to get a head coaching job in the NBA. It didn't happen. And so this is all with the frame of reference that he's getting the job after uh, JT3. And if there was ever a college job, this would have to be the one. And then the final sentence here is, and he'll never be seen as the failure there. No matter how this goes, they'll always love Pat in the district, just the way they always love John. Clinging to the past is how we got to this point to begin with. Um I think that's all right by the way they'll always love patrick there yeah which, ma which makes this more complicated and awkward than anybody would like i uh completely agree uh there is no uh, i don't want to say there's no animosity but ewing is not facing uh the kind of uh negative blowback from georgetown fans and alumni the way that i think a lot of other coaches would and a lot of that is understandable because the greatest era in the program's history, uh, he is one of the two key figures in that uh, with obviously with Big John there. But I th I didn't listen to this segment um, and I can't remember how I heard about it, but I believe Tony Kornheiser, everyone knows who Tony is. He has a daily podcast. Uh, at some point recently, he went on his podcast. He said Georgetown needs to fire Patrick Ewing or something there close to it and basically railed against how irrelevant Georgetown has become and that a change has to happen. Like you're Georgetown. You cannot s simply choose to continue to exist like this and if there starts to be more voices in that area that really start to to write and talk about it john feinstein someone who writes for the washington post and is you know one of the most prominent writers of men's college basketball across the past two three four decades then i think you might see but i also think patrick ewing is a prideful smart well-respected man in basketball period yeah he's got a crappy team again but he I don't doubt that he is going through daily self-reflection on the job he's doing where Georgetown is and is going to hit an inflection point. If he has not privately already, can I get this team, this school, this program back to where it should be, you know, nationally relevant, you know, in the top 25, if not close to it, getting to the NCAA tournament. If he thinks that he can do that and he, there's, and he wants to go for one more year, Georgetown's going to give him another year. 
But if he's uncertain about that, for the betterment of his alma mater and for that program, you know, Patrick Ewing needs to consider stepping down and letting someone else come in and take that job. Who that would be, well, that's a fascinating conversation for another time that we'll talk about if and when we even get to that point this season because you will finally, I would think, have a true cutting of the ties from the big John era and where Georgetown can go moving forward would be intriguing. Oh, by the way, if it did open this year in the same year that Maryland was open, that adds even more fascinating intrigue to the job in general, but they're 0 and eight. They've lost nine in a row. They got a home game against St. John's on, on Thursday, uh, another loss there at home. Uh, then you got Providence. You got a couple with Creighton. I mean, it's just, it's not going well right now. And, and, it's it's a uh, it's a bummer because Georgetown really you know it should not be in this it should not be in this position man it should not this there is hundred, not uh, it's one there, thing to be kind of average and like every other year like you're trying to get it going but you're in the tournament then you're not then you're nit then you're not then you're in the tournament you're a seven seed that's not what this is man Georgetown has not been I know it made that great run in a fanless garden last year and we opened a podcast and probably spent 17 minutes talking about it because it was because rightfully so because it was really cool to see Patrick Ewing guide Georgetown back to the NCAA tournament but this program since 2016 15 and 18 14 and 18 then Ewing gets the job 15 and 15 with a 5 and 13 record in the league 19 and 14 some improvement 9 and 9 okay 2020 happens. They weren't going to the tournament anyway. Two games under 500, only five wins in the league. Last year, they weren't good. They got hot. And this year, 6-13 and 13 with an 0-8 record. What are we doing here? Something's got to change soon. They're 179th at Kempom right now. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, please smash that like button like uh, your Brandon Davies. You have consent. Brandon Davies would do it. He risked a trip to the Final Four to smash. You're not risking anything. So knock that out. And while you're here, also subscribe to the YouTube channel. And uh, turn on the notifications. That way you get alerted uh, every single time that we go live, which, of course, is uh, going to be Sunday nights, Wednesday mornings, and Friday mornings. Deadleg, before we get out of here, your court report is publishing on Wednesday, and I know it features um, a story connected to my favorite basketball player in the world, John ja Morant. Yeah, so just uh, just a heads up. This will publish soon if you're watching live. Court report will start with Murray State, which is 20 and two, and awesome again. Um, it's just it's a couple of vignettes about how you know the Grizzlies apparently had a five percent chance at landing the number two pick in 2019, and they got it. They landed it, and they opted to draft John Morant, which is looking like one of the better draft picks of the past half decade, if not decade altogether, and. It's really been a great thing for John ja Morant and Murray State because that's less than three hours between those two places. And John ja Morant has been back to the Murray State campus like close to 20 times since he was drafted. There are off-season pickup games with current Murray State players and and you know recent players and and those pickup games and and kind of being able to have Ja so close um, has had an impact on the team this season. And certainly, you know, I didn't get a chance to talk to to jaw for the story but i gotta believe that the memphis grizzlies being as good as they are and john morant being an mvp candidate i think all these factors there's just some sort of uh tangible energy that is really helping both sides here so that's the lead thing won't give too much away but there's also a really cool picture of um of that 2019 team last summer getting in a pickup game uh that you can check in on i also have got a story about four teams that had bad novembers you know they were 500 or worse through uh through november have since turned it around and are uh are, are just cruising into february maybe gonna make the tournament maybe not but i talked to head coaches of all four of those teams who are they you're gonna have to read it to find out Ooh. and then i do give the mountain west some love because i think it's gonna be a four bid league this season colorado state boise state wyoming san diego state all in the mix fresno state's on the outside looking in but it also it's got a respectable record and can play spoiler potentially there so the mountain west overdue it's going to have its best season since 2013 so those are the three biggest items on the wednesday court report if you could uh read it go on your cbs sports app always appreciated but uh but yeah man murray state leg oh, i'll end with this legitimate at large candidate okay as of this morning i had to refresh my numbers murray state 26th in the net my man 21st in strength of record top 40 in uh ken palm and bpi so they got a real shot here now they got belmont in the league but you know, this isn't just like, oh, gaudy record, good team. Yeah, Murray State 3 is a good. No, viable 
viable NCAA tournament team. And I'd have them on like the 10 line right now if you ask me. You see that right behind me? You look, I want you to gaze right behind me. You know what that is right behind me? That's where John Morant is about to put on a show tonight. Oh, uh, they're in New York City. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I checked the schedule. In New York, so the garden is directly behind you. Yeah, more or less. 20 blocks. Okay. 20, so 20 yeah. blocks behind me. The John Morant show comes to Midtown Manhattan tonight. Do you see this stat? He's averaging like 35.4 points, 7.2 rebounds, 7.2 assists per game. Uh, the past seven games at the age of 22. In the history of the NBA, the only players to average more than 35, 7, and 7 in any seven-game span, age 22 or under, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Ja Morant. That's the list. That's the list, my man. And to your court report item, Jaza Hooper. He's just in the gym all the time. Like, uh, you'll see videos pop up. He's at some high school playing with Kennedy Chandler like two, year, you know, two years ago. Uh, like, he and Kennedy got tight because, you know, that just yeah. – he, he goes and plays with you – know, not anybody. Like, you can't play with him. But, like, he's playing at high schools. I mean, it's a MV, legitimate MVP. Game. He's about to start an All-Star game. And, and this summer – You'll see him, your video of him at a high school just hooping with a bunch of 17 year olds. Um, he, uh, Eric Hasseltine, who's a radio play by play voice of the Grizzlies, is a good friend of mine. He said that when they're on the road, like if they're in Detroit and there's like a, a good high school basketball game, like John would go. And you'll just see John Morant sitting in a high school gym in Detroit watching a game. A few weeks ago, uh, Grizzlies had an off night. There's video services. Ja is down in South Haven, Mississippi watching the G League team. Like there's 20 people in the whole place. John Morant's just sitting there, you know, one of them. He just likes, he loves basketball, loves being around it. So it's not surprising. He's constantly going back to Murray and, uh, and, and hooping with those guys. And I, I don't doubt for a second that they, they benefit from it. Shouts to Devin down to shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Doug Brandt, legend. Shouts to Lauren. Now. Thank you guys once again for listening. I own college basketball podcast, middle of the dumbest pandemic of my entire lifetime. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. They ain't going to take us off for of misinformation. They're not trying to take us off for of misinformation. You know what I'm saying? I you know do know. And by, th and by the way, um, plenty of you are now listening. Uh, you know, the number, the download numbers are really jumping here. So I want to say, Thanks to everyone that's come on board. You missed some fun stuff in November and December and early January, but the numbers have continued to increase. So thank you. And uh, would just ask, you know, if you've got friends that you think like college basketball, know like college basketball, think they might like a podcast, just pass along. You know, this, this is only going to get more fun and obviously more frequent as we get into March there. But uh, the numbers continue to rise. So thank you to everyone. And if you are not uh, one that wants to watch, but you still want to just help out the show, just subscribe. We are not a had it in the notes. I think we're like a hundred or so away from getting to 3000. We're almost there, almost to 3000. So thank you again. And uh, just keep passing on word. We're happy to uh, continue to grow the audience. And for everyone that likes to chat during the show live, we appreciate you as well. And that's all I'm going to shut up. I'm going to try and get us out in under an hour for two consecutive shows. I'm done. If you're over at Apple podcast, leave a review while you do that five star. There's more of us than there are of them needs to be reflected there's more of us than there are of them subscribe to the youtube channel if you got friends who are yeah into basketball but also uh fights between camels extinct birds you know what else let them know what's up we're gonna talk to you again on friday morning till then take care